Good morning to all of you. A warm welcome to our Zoom webinar organized by GMO Sri Knowledge Academy. Kindly mute your microphone and turn off your camera during the presentation and use the chat box to clear your doubts at the end of the session. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Prabhat Kumar Singh, consultant, general and hip mobility surgeon, currently attached to National Hospital Sri Lanka. And his lecture is going to be on patient with PR bleeding. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Chadrika. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, first, I would like to thank GMO History Knowledge Academy for giving me this opportunity to uh, speak on a surgical topic. So uh, today I'm going to speak about rectal bleeding. Uh, so before uh, talking on rectal bleeding, I thought that I should give an overview on uh, lower GI bleeding so that you can have a better understanding. So, uh, so if you take lower GI bleeding, uh, annual incidence is about 20 to 27 uh, cases per 100,000 population. So, uh, and most of the patients, they don't seek medical attention like uh, mostly the patients who are having fissures, hemorrhoids, which, which are not troublesome, they won't come for uh, medical uh, checkups. So it is one of the causes uh, for uh, hospital admissions and it carries a significant mortality of uh, about 10 to 20%. Uh, so when we classify uh, GI bleeding, so mostly it's uh, occult lower GI bleeding uh, so that you can detect only on, on uh, uh, patients who are anemic and uh, having hypochromic microcytic anemia or patients with uh, fecal occult blood positive. Then uh, the other two groups are more evident uh, who presents with moderate to severe GI bleeding. So uh, hematochezia is uh, one of the conditions where uh, upper GI cause uh, causing severe bleeding that it presents as PR bleeding. And uh, the importance of this is that it has a very significant mortality, about 20%. And especially this uh, occurs in elderly who are more than 65 years old. So uh, how are we define uh, lower GI bleeding? So anatomically, uh, uh, fourth part of the duodenum attached to uh, attached to the upper jejunum at uh, ligament of traits. So any bleeding occurs beyond ligament of traits is called lower GI bleeding. So this include small bubble bleeding, colonic bleeding, as well as rectal bleeding. Uh, the killer thing about small bubble bleeding is that uh, it's obscure and difficult to localize. So uh, when we're talking about lower GI bleeding, we should keep in mind that uh, upper GI bleeding is also a cause for lower GI bleeding. About say, uh, uh, most of the time, 85% uh, of the time, lower GI bleeding is a cause beyond the ligament of traits, but about 15 to 10% of the time, it may be uh, a cause above the ligament of traits, mostly a perforated, I mean, uh, mostly a bleeding duodenal ulcer. <clears throat> so uh, when a patient comes to a GP clinic or um, ex expressing that they have uh, PR bleeding, so uh, what we should do in examination is mainly to do abdominal examination to find any obvious uh, masses and do a digital examination of the rectum. So uh, Mostly uh, low rectal tumors and low rectal pathologies are palpable to a uh, digital examination, uh, digital rectal examination. And as a baseline test, we can do a full blood count uh, to assess the degree of uh, bleeding. So uh, should we do a uh, tumor markers like carcinoma embryonic antigen in patients with rectal bleeding? So evidence says that uh, there's no point doing a 
tumor markers in a patient with uh, we are bleeding to diagnose a disease. So unless you suspect a tumor, there's no point doing a CEA at uh, acute admissions. And uh, other thing is, uh, it is obvious that a patient coming with obvious PR bleeding, there's no point of doing a fecal local blood test. So if a young patient comes uh, with PR bleeding, abdominal pain, history of fever, mucus discharge, we have to always think of inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, so if you are suspecting inflammatory bowel disease, uh, we can do a fecal calprotectin level. So if the fecal calprotectin is positive, uh, in subsequent colonoscopy, finding, uh, this, uh, finding this patient having inflammatory bowel disease is high. So it has a high positive predictive value. <clears throat> So at the um, at a GP setting, we can do a proctoscopy, and uh, as a screening. But only thing is uh, that we have to remember, even though we do a proctoscopy, we should substitute this. Uh, we should uh, send these patients for a flexible sigmoidoscopy, because uh, a proctoscopy cannot substitute a flexible sigmoidoscopy. So why do we uh, do a flexible sigmoidoscopy? Is that now, if you look at the colonic cancers, about two third of the cancers occur in the uh, left side of the colon. So in the history, what are the red flag signs? So uh, when a patient comes with PR bleeding, if they have uh, these uh, four or five uh, signs and symptoms, that you have to be uh, a bit cautious because this may be a presentation of a more sinister pathology like cancer. So if a patient comes with PR bleeding with alteration of bowel habits, especially diarrhea, and increased frequency. And uh, PR bleeding associated with significant anemia, weight loss, or abdominal or rectal masses should be taken seriously. So these are called red flag signs. So uh, <clears throat> any patient who needs, uh, who comes with PR bleeding, needs uh, following criteria should be referred urgently for a specialist for further assessment. So if a patient aged more than 40 years coming with alteration of bowel habits, uh, as I told you before, like uh, and uh, symptoms last for six weeks or more, or 60-year-old uh, uh, patient coming with uh, rectal bleeding, even without change of bowel habits, should be referred uh, to a, a surgical specialist for further assessment. And uh, finding of rectal bleeding with a palpable rectal mass is obviously a significant finding. So the other patients who need urgent referral is uh, uh, patients with strong family history of colorectal malignancy uh, and who are very anxious uh, about colorectal cancers. And uh, if the patient who, uh, who had uh, uh, hemorrhoids and uh, still there's persistent bleeding, uh, they should be referred uh, for further assessment. And uh, patients who had previous pelvic radiotherapy or suspected inflammatory bowel disease should be uh, subjected to further assessments. So usually patients less than 45 years, flexible sigmoidoscopy is enough to assess, the, assess uh, for rectal bleeding. But uh, patients who has family history of colorectal cancer, we should do a colonoscopy. So according to British Society of uh, Gastroenterology guidelines, BSG guidelines, uh, so this is about the asymptomatic patients with positive family history. So now I'm talking about asymptomatic patients with positive family history. So if there's uh, one first degree family member with diagnosed colorectal cancer so at the age of 55 or more, we have to do a screening colonoscopy. But if there are two or more first degree relatives uh, in the family, then uh, the age that we should do colonoscopy is uh, around less than uh, 50 years. So as I told you before, if it is less than 45 years, flexible sigmoidoscopy is enough. But if it is more than 45 years uh, coming with rectal bleeding, colonosc full colonoscopy is beneficial. 
and uh, there are uh, other group of patients who are frail and unfit for uh, colonoscopy because it's kind of a major procedure and it has associated complication. It needs sedation. Uh, the investigation that we can order for these kind of patients is uh, CT colonography. Now, historically, we did very minimus uh, for to screening, but it's no longer recommended because it has a significant miss rate. <clears throat> so uh, here, uh, these are uh, this is a rough guide for general population screening for uh, for any rectal uh, GI pathology. So uh, what we can do is we can do fecal occult blood yearly. Uh, or every two yearly uh, from age 50 to 75. So, uh, or we can do five yearly sigmoidoscopy from age of 50. So these are the kind of screening guidance that uh, you can use uh, to uh, assess general population. So what are the common causes for uh, lower GI bleeding? So uh, common causes include, uh, the most common one is diverticulosis. And uh, then there are anorectal disease, which includes uh, fissures and hemorrhoids and uh, proctitis and other things. And uh, ischemia, inflammatory bowel disease, neoplasia, and AV malformations are the causes that would uh, come up to uh, allogia bleeding. So what is diverticulosis? Diverticulosis is the commonest cause for uh, low GI bleeding. So it's interesting that uh, after age of 60 years, around 50% of people have uh, evidence of, radiological evidence of diverticular, but all of these are not symptomatic. So out of these, very uh, little amount, about 10 to 20% become symptomatic. Uh, the commonest uh, side is the left colon. And uh, in, uh, mainly in developed countries, uh, diverticuli are more seen in uh, left colon because they, their diet is uh, like they are fi low fiber diet uh, in developed countries. So that's why they have more left sided co uh, colonic diverticuli. So out of this, 20% develop bleeding. So if you compare the left side and right side diverticuli, right side diverticuli bleeds commonly about 50 to 90 percent. The reason behind this is that uh, on the right side uh, diverticuli, they have a broad base and uh, their dome is uh, big. So uh, there's a big gap between the diverticuli and the penetrating vessel. So they tend to bleed more. So most of the patients bleeding stops spontaneous, but 5 percent can have catastrophic bleeding. So what is the characteristics of bleeding is that usually it's uh, painless, but it can be associated with abdominal pain. It does uh, overlying diverticulitis as well. It's sudden onset. It's classically maroon color. And 80% uh, of the time it uh, settles spontaneously and one third will repeat. So the second category is anorectal disease, mainly hemorrhoids and anal fissures. These are very common. And uh, I would talk about this at uh, the latter part of the lecture so I can give more details on this. Then uh, a bit about mesenteric ischemia. So mesenteric ischemia occurs uh, either it's embolic, thrombotic or non-occlusive in nature. So especially uh, commonly affects superior mesenteric artery, but it has to uh, affect, uh, as we all know, the blood supply of the colon and small bubble. Uh, it's supplied by superior mesenteric, inferior mesenteric and celiac axis. So at least two or more uh, two vessels should be uh, affected to uh, have symptoms. So the main risk factors are cardiac disease and atherosclerosis for acute ischemia. And then there are another entity called uh, uh, NOMI. Is, that is, uh, happens in critically ill patients mm, who are on vasopressors. And uh, <clears throat> venous thrombosis, superior mesenteric vein thrombosis, uh, can uh, cause intestinal swelling and uh, later on it can develop into bleeding. So ischemic colitis uh, is also uh, uh, another entity where the blood supply to the colon is, uh, is impaired and uh, it can be gangrenous or non-gangrenous uh, or acute or transient. 
and commonly the left colon is uh, involved because uh, blood supply to the left colon is less. That is why it's commonly involved. So what happens is when uh, the blood supply is less, then mucosa become necrotic and it bleeds. So this is also another cause for uh, bleeding. So then a bit about uh, inflammatory bowel disease. So it's mainly Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. <clears throat> so uh, this is usually happen in young, uh, young uh, younger population, persons with abdominal cramp, crampy abdominal pain, and uh, mucus and blood and mucus diarrhea. So as we all know, the Crohn's disease mainly uh, affects the uh, distal ileum and the cecum and it can affect from our trainers, uh, but commonly there is about 40% affects the cecum and uh, terminal ileum and ulcerative colitis uh, commonly affects the uh, rectum. So uh, then another cause is that uh, more sinister causes the colonic cancers and rectal cancers. Uh, then bit about uh, AV malformations and angiodysplasia. So uh, AV malformations are, these are mainly congenital and uh, they occur in colonic submucosa and with trauma, they can bleed. Uh, but angiodysplasia is like previously healthy vessels, later on they degenerate and uh, become hepatic uh, and they can bleed. 75% of the time angiodysplasia causes uh, cases involve the right colon. And it is one of the significant causes uh, for uh, small intestinal bleeds. So how are you going to uh, work up and uh, work up a patient coming with uh, moderate to severe bleeding? So this you don't see at uh, GP setup. So these patients straight away come to hospital. So they are critically ill. You need a basic resuscitation. Uh, and then we have to rule out any upper GI causes for uh, these lower GI bleeding. As I told you, about 15% of the time, it's a upper GI cause which causes this lower GI bleeding. So uh, easiest way is to put a NG tube and aspirate and see whether there's blood in, uh, in the NG tube. So from that, we can rule out any upper GI cause. Uh, so what are the other investigations that can be done? So in a stable patient, uh, the best way is to do best method is to do a colonoscopy. But uh, practically, it's quite difficult to uh, do a colonoscopy in a bleeding patient. And but with the experience, uh, uh, endoscopist can achieve about uh, can identify the cause of bleeding in about seventy to eighty percent of the time. <clears throat> so uh, the importance of doing a colonoscopy is that you can identify the source of bleeding as well as uh, you can do a curative management like application of clips, epinephrine injection, and APC. So uh, there's an interesting uh, study in, uh, by Intercollegiate Guidelines. They have said that in a randomized controlled trial, so uh, if you do a colonoscopy within eight hours of bleeding, uh, it has not improved the survival. But uh, uh, if you prepare a patient properly and do it within 48 hours, you can easily identify the source of bleeding and <clears throat> address it properly. So what are the radiological uh, imaging techniques, uh, which includes uh, nucleus scintigraphy and uh, mesenteric angiography? So nucleus scintigraphy is uh, that you give uh, uh, radio labeled, uh, you assess the bleeding by giving a radio labeled uh, material. So this is, this can't localize where the bleeding is. It can give a rough idea. Say when you do a nucleus scintigraphy, you can identify whether it's bleeding from left colon or right colon. And it is not therapeutic as well. So to identify in a nucleus scintigraphy, uh, bleeding rate should be 0.1 to 0.5 cc per minute. And uh, the specificity is less, it's about 50%. So disadvantage, as I told you before, that uh, you can't intervene. And uh, it gives only a rough idea about the uh, site of bleeding. Then a uh, bit about uh, angiography. Uh, so yeah, to do a mesenteric angiography, you need uh, 
the patient should bleed at least a uh, minimum bleed of 0.5 cc per minute to identify the uh, identify localize the place of bleeding so importance of this uh, mesenteric angiography is that you can identify where it bleeds and at the same time you can put coils or you can inject vasopressin and uh, stop the bleeding source so most commonly the commonest uh, uh, is the superior mesenteric artery then uh, you would examine the inferior mesenteric artery then lastly the celiac trunk <clears throat> so as i told you before uh, it has a low sensitivity and uh, and it has a uh, significant morbidity as well. So uh, the ultimately, uh, the, if all these measures fail, then the patient is subjected to surgical intervention. So uh, emergency surgery is needed in about 20% of patients. Uh, problem with emergency surgery is that now you have done a lot of investigations, but still you couldn't localize where the bleeding is. So when you open up also, it's very difficult to identify where it bleeds because, uh, because the whole colon and the small bubble contains blood. <clears throat> so uh, for that, uh, what you can do is uh, once you open up, you can do a intraoperative uh, entroscopy. Uh, you can do a small entrotomy at the colon or the small bubble and uh, do, put a scope inside and try to identify where the bleeding is. Uh, now, no longer blind colectomies are, colectomies are recommended, but in, in cases where there's evident that the blood is limited only to colon, and uh, you can go ahead with a subtotal colectomy. So, uh, now, when we are taking a patient to emergency surgery, so how are we going to decide who needs emergency surgery or uh, who can wait? So there's a rough guide. If you need more than six units of blood uh, per 24 hours, that and uh, this patient is still bleeding, they need emergency surgery. So if a patient needs more than 10 units of blood within 24 hours, they have a very poor outcome compared to patient who needs uh, less than 10 units of blood, and it is 45 versus 7%. So as I told you before, segmental uh, colonic resections are preferred if we can identify where the bleeding is. But in the cases of uh, that uh, uncertainty and bleeding is limited to colon, subtotal colectomy can be done. So a bit about obscure bleeding. So obscure bleeding is uh, defined as that when you have done a lower GI and upper GI, but still you can't find a cause, it's mainly obscure. So it's mainly the area that difficult to assess is the small bubble. So how are we going to assess small bubble is that you can use wireless capsular endoscopy. Uh, and you can do a double balloon entroscopy. So since uh, uh, now, the capsule endoscopy is gaining more popularity over double balloon endoscopy because it's difficult to perform. So uh, most common causes for this uh, obscure bleeding are angiodysplasia of uh, small bowel uh, and uh, carcinoid tumors mm, are the most common causes. Then uh, come into anorectal disease. So this is the uh, this is a, one of the more common causes for PR bleeding. So main two uh, enorectal diseases are hemorrhoids and anal fissures. So I'll talk about uh, anal fissures. So these patients most commonly present to your GP practice with uh, classic symptoms. They complain of uh, pain or passage of glass particles while passing uh, stools. And uh, it is uh, very painful and uh, it, it's, uh, they are like afraid to defecate because of this persistent pain. So what happens in anal fissure is there's a tear in the epithelial lining of the anal canal. It's one of the most common uh, problems encountered and uh, fissures can be acute, chronic, typical or atypical. So it's one of the common causes for uh, pain and uh, most commonly affects young uh, patients about 20 to 40 years. And most of the fissures are acute in nature. Usually they resolve within uh, six weeks without any treatment. 
So if they continue beyond six weeks, it's called chronic fissures. So in the history, it's a bright red streaky bleeding on stools and with uh, associated severe pain. Uh, in some patients, you can do a physical examination and you can see if you put the patient on ja uh, prone jackknife and uh, separate the buttocks, you can see a linear separation in the anoderm. So 90% of the time, it happens uh, at the posterior midline. So, or else you call it six o'clock position. So this, uh, uh, this clock positions are defined when a patient is lying supine lithotomy. So 12 o'clock is anterior, six o'clock is posterior. So mostly fissures are uh, posterior midline 90% of the time and anterior midline, it's about 10% of the time. So uh, generally resolved within four to six weeks with appropriate management. But chronic fissures, uh, they tend to uh, persist beyond six to eight weeks. So chronic fissures, when you examine, it's uh, you can classically see a sentinel tag at the uh, outside of the fissure and inside there's an inner papilla. And uh, base is, uh, in the base you can see uh, internal sphincter fibers and edges will be rolled up. So those are the signs of a chronic fissure. So then there's a entity called atypical fissures. These atypical fissures are associated with other diseases like Crohn's disease, uh, HIV, cancers, syphilis, and tuberculosis. So you have to have a rough idea if a patient presents with an atypical fissure. So how are you going to identify atypical fissure? Is that usually typical fissures occur at six o'clock and 12 o'clock position. If there are fissures which occur in other, other areas of the inner canal, so most likely it can be a atypical fissure. So uh, what is the pathogenesis of fissures? So there are different theories that how a fissure occurs. So some say that it's, uh, uh, it's a passage of uh, hard stools, which causes trauma to uh, rectal mucosa and causes, uh, causes uh, fissures. Or some say it's due to uh, sphincter hypertonicity. But this sphincter hypertonicity may be uh, due to fissure itself. And why it is mainly uh, six o'clock and 12 o'clock position is, that is called the watershed line where the blood supply is minimal at uh, six o'clock and 12 o'clock position. That's why uh, it tends to cause uh, fissures in those two positions. So how are you going to uh, treat these patients? So, uh, so American Society of Colorectal Surgeons says that conservative therapy is the safest and we have to all try uh, first uh, conservatively. So you know, there's a, another randomized trial comparing uh, fiber alone diet with other treatments. Now, if you take fiber alone uh, as a treatment for acute anal fissures, 87 of the patients get healed. So dietary modification enough uh, is, uh, only is enough in certain groups of patients. But uh, patients who have persistent fissures more than six weeks, uh, you have to uh, seek other modes of treatment. So uh, likewise, for chronic fissures, they have done a randomized, 50 randomized control trials. So they have uh, compared uh, non-operative therapy uh, for chronic anal fissures and the healing rate was 34. So the chronic, uh, anal fissures are difficult to manage. So why it is uh, chronic uh, fissures are difficult to manage is because they have an inherent problem in the internal sphincter. Internal sphincter hypertonicity is the main problem in chronic fissures. So we have to treat the internal sphincter hypertonicity to uh, tackle these kind of uh, uh, problems, right? So what are the topical agents that can be used for uh, fissures? So mainly uh, we use nitrates and cal calcium channel blockers and also injectable agents like botulinum toxin can be used. So a uh, bit about uh, GTN, nitric, uh, so it acts, nitric oxide acts as a muscle relaxant. So it relaxes the internal sphincter. And there's a landmark trial uh, in, done in 1997. They compared GTN alone with placebo and uh, shown that it's about 70% successful. But later on studies uh, says that GTN is not that successful. 
so anyway uh, gtn should be used uh, topical gtn should be used as a first line after that modification you can use gtn as a first line treatment but the problem with uh, gtn local application is that uh, patients tend to get uh, headache but it's a tolerable headache but most of the patients about 60 to 70 can get headache and other thing is uh, with the uh, time uh, if you use long term gtn they get tachyphylaxis and the desired effect is not there so why gtn has a high uh, high failure rate is mainly due to the uh, gtn causes internal sphincter relaxation but it doesn't last long it lasts only for 2 hours so that is why gtn uh, tends to uh, fail in uh, some instances managing uh, fissures <clears throat> so uh, after uh, we try with gtn then we can introduce diltiazem 2% cream so this can be applied twice a daily for 8 weeks and uh, it has ability to heal fissures uh, which are not healed by gtn so it has a less side effect profile and uh, acts same as uh, gtn uh, relaxing the internal sphincter so uh, then bit about botulinum uh, injections so uh, there are several studies so they have compared botox with gtn and uh, They say that uh, GTN is uh, more effective. Uh, sorry, this, uh, this study says that uh, Botox is more effective compared to GTN. <clears throat> so uh, usually Botox 20 uh, international units is injected at uh, 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock positions, so which causes internal sphincter relaxation, and uh, this would uh, uh, leads to healing of the fissure. But the disadvantage is it, it has high recurrence rate and also sometimes it can cause uh, incontinence mainly for flatus. So uh, a bit about chronic fissures, as I told you before, uh, the hallmark of chronic fissure is triad of hypertrophied internal sphincter, hypertrophied uh, anal papilla and external sentinel tag. So in these patients, we can do fissurectomy where you resect the internal papilla uh, skin tag and the rolled up uh, edges of the fissure, which would allow healing of the uh, fissure. So uh, in instances where uh, you suspect atypic atypical fissures, HIV, Crohn's disease should be uh, considered and uh, treatment of these two diseases would uh, lead to healing of the uh, disease. So, as a summary for fissures, uh, I can give you a treatment guideline. So, say now if uh, uh, there's a fissure more than six weeks duration, we can give a high fiber diet and stool softeners and sit bath. So, 90% of the uh, fissures heal. But in failing that, we can try 0.2% GTN twice or thrice a week for six to eight weeks. So, if it fails, then we can try diltiazem. And uh, after failing of this medical therapy, then we have to consider either, either Botox injection or uh, surgery, lateral internal sphincterotomy. Yeah. So uh, then a bit about hemorrhoids. Uh, it's one of another common cause for PR bleeding. And uh, I mean, uh, you can't have any population studies on hemorrhoids because some patients, they don't, uh, even though they have hemorrhoids, they won't come to hospitals. So it's underreported. So hemorrhoids, as we all know, it's uh, these are anal cushions we dilate uh, due to uh, due to various reasons, including uh, uh, chronic strain uh, and stress, and become uh, dilated uh, vessels, which causes bleeding. So mainly they are located in three o'clock, eleven o'clock, and seven o'clock positions. And uh, the importance of anal cushions is that uh, they contribute to 15 to 20 percent of resting anal pressure. So there are internal hemorrhoids and external hemorrhoids. So uh, you demarcate them uh, uh, along the dentate line. If it is beyond dentate line, it's called external hemorrhoids. And if it is proximal to uh, dentate line, it's called internal hemorrhoids. 
So problem with external hemorrhoids is when they are thrombos, it's extremely painful because it's innervated by uh, the ectoderm uh, from the uh, surrounding skin. So it's very painful. So they need urgent surgery. So internal uh, hemorrhoids, which are located proximal to dentate line, they are covered with column epithelium and viscerally innervated. So they are painless. Uh, so they are uh, not sensitive to pain, touch, and temperature. <clears throat> so Golliger uh, classification uh, classifies the degree of hemorrhoids. So first degree hemorrhoids are, uh, they are inside the inner canal, but still they bleed, but they don't prolapse. Second degree hemorrhoids prolapse, but spontaneously reduce. Third degree hemorrhoids prolapse and require manual reduction. Fourth degree hemorrhoids prolapsed and reducible. So uh, uh, internal hemorrhoids, they typically cause painless bleeding and uh, sometimes they cause tissue, uh, uh, tissue protrusion and mucus discharge. And uh, if the hemorrhoids are a little bit bigger, they can uh, feel uh, incomplete evacuation. So usually causes bright red bleeding at the end of defecation, as we all know. So uh, how are we going to manage these patients? So uh, first degree and second degree hemorrhoids, we can try with uh, non-medical uh, management, like uh, uh, change, changing the diet into high fiber diet around 20 to uh, 35 grams per day and increase fluid intake uh, and uh, try with some uh, stool softeners. But uh, uh, this is okay for first degree uh, or second degree hemorrhoids, but third and fourth degree hemorrhoids cannot be managed like this. So uh, other common uh, method of managing hemorrhoids, especially second degree and uh, third degree hemorrhoids is use of rubber band ligation. So uh, we can place uh, rubber bands uh, but we have to be very careful when we are placing rubber bands. If you place near the dentate line, they can get severe pain and uh, you have to remove the rubber band uh, that you put. And uh, the other problem with uh, RBL is that uh, they can get uh, delayed bleeding after five to seven days once the uh, hemorrhoid sloughs off. So there are not many complications. Complications are very rare, about 05 to 0.8%. Uh, in RBL, so mainly pain, uh, and sometimes you can get uh, urinary retention in the acute period, and uh, bleeding after bland, band slip, uh, slippage can occur. So, and we have to advise the patients that about after five to ten days, once the uh, hemorrhoid sloughs off, you can get secondary hemorrhage. So, we have to always educate the patients about this. And the other important thing is because of the secondary hemorrhage, we have to stop. Patients who are on antiplatelets and anticoagulants one week before. Because patients who are on these uh, blood thinners are at higher risk of secondary bleeding. And it has a very good success rate, 50 to 100%. And uh, sclerotherapy, uh, it is initially done in 19, uh, 1869. And uh, we uh, inject 5% uh, phenol or hypertonic saline. Uh, 5 ml can be injected using a, a very small uh, spinal needle. Uh, the mechanism is that we make uh, vessels to be thrombosed and sclerosed. So at a time, as uh, well as uh, rubber band ligation, first uh, we have to at least do two sides, not more than that, because uh, there'll be significant pain after these procedures. And this also can cause post-procedure pain, urinary retention and sepsis. Uh, so, it has a failure rate higher than banding. And uh, you know, if you take long-term uh, hemorrhoid-free, uh, at, at four years, only 8% is uh, hemorrhoid-free uh, after sclerotherapy. So it's not, it is inferior to rubber band ligation. <clears throat> then bit about uh, surgical management. Uh, surgical management either can be, uh, uh, it, there are two techniques, it's called open and close hemorrhoidectomy. It's, there's not major difference, but it's a very minute difference. So in UK, uh, they do milligan morgan hemorrhoidectomy, which is open hemorrhoidectomy. That is uh, where you uh, remove uh, the hemorrhoid complexes, leaving intervening uh, mucosal bridges. Uh, but in closed hemorrhoidectomy or fugus and hemorrhoidectomy, which is more popular in US, uh, after resecting hemorrhoidal complexes, they to suture the mucosa to uh, anal skin. 
so the importance of uh, close hemorrhoidectomies that uh, healing is more i mean quicker and the uh, pain is less so uh, main complications after hemorrhoidectomy when you advise patients after hemorrhoidectomy their main com complaint is pain so there are there's evidence that uh, use of prophylactic prophylactic oral metronidazole and topical diltiazem or gta can cause less pain after hemorrhoidectomy so later uh, complications include hemorrhage infection and a bit of fecal uh, incontinence if uh, the sphincter is damaged and most dreaded complication is a uh, anal stenosis so when we are doing hemorrhoidectomy we have to be careful that we re leave adequate skin bridges or mucosal bridges in between hemorrhoids so when there are three large hemorrhoidal complexes it's better to do subtotal uh, or remove uh, one or two hemorrhoidal complexes at a time and do uh, complete the rest later on so a bit about uh, doppler guided trans anal hemorrhoidal ligation this is a technique where you put a doppler probe inside the rectum and identify the uh, rectal So then uh, uh, a bit about uh, stapler hemorrhoidectomy. So stapler hemorrhoidectomy is said to be uh, less painful than open hemorrhoidectomy. But uh, so we are, here what we do is that we use a uh, hemorrhoidal stapler uh, where you cut a donut or rim of tissue which containing hemorrhoids and anastomose uh, the mucosa and submucosa with stapler. The problem with this is it has higher fissure rate. And uh, but pain is comparatively less. Uh, so what are the common complications after any procedure is uh, post-op pain. And uh, if a patient presents with uh, bleeding after hemorrhoidectomy, so first we can do some uh, anal packing uh, with uh, uh, sobs. And uh, see if it is not responding, then we have to uh, re anesthetize the patient and identify the bleeder and uh, control it. So, hemorrhoid crisis, we commonly say it's prolapsed uh, thrombose hemorrhoids. So, prolapsed hemorrhoids, they, these patients come with severe pain, tissue necrosis, and evidence of sepsis. So, uh, they need adequate pain relief, and we have to try with uh, stool softeners and apply uh, warm soaps or ice packs to reduce the in inflammation. And we can start antibodies as this kind of a prolapsed hemorrhoid. <clears throat> and uh, if it is not responding to uh, medical therapy, then uh, uh, subtotal hemorrhoidectomy should be done. At this point now, as you can see in the picture, that the whole uh, rectum, uh, whole anal canal is involved. But if you reset everything, then they will develop uh, anal strictures later on. So uh, subtotal hemorrhoidectomy is uh, preferred in these instances. And uh, other important thing is about rectal varices because uh, if we misinterpret hemorrhoids as rectal varices, uh, they can bleed a lot and uh, even catastrophic bleeding can occur and patients can die. So uh, it's difficult to differentiate rectal varices from, from hemorrhoids, but uh, if you take a uh, history, use of alcohol and other signs of uh, liver disease, uh, you can easily diagnose. So the treatment for this uh, rectal varices is reduction of portal hypertension. So it's form of uh, transjugal intrahepatic portosystemic shunts or portocaval shunts. Uh, the best treatment is liver transplantation. But in case of bleeding, we can uh, do a direct suture ligation uh, at some instances. So this is a picture of a uh, rectal varices, uh, it's difficult to identify from a hemorrhoid. Uh, so a bit about pregnancy and uh, hemorrhoids. So it's, uh, it's they get uh, hemorrhoids mainly due to increased intraabdominal pressure, dehydration, constipation, and uh, they rarely need surgical uh, treatment during pregnancy. And we have to be very careful uh, if we uh, apply uh, rubber bands or other uh, means of treatment in these patients it can induce labor 
and can go into urinary retention. So it's better to manage conservatively. And if they persist beyond the pregnancy, then we can address it later on. And a uh, bit about radiation proctitis, this is uh, mainly for patients who had uh, pelvic uh, radiotherapy. Uh, they tend to bleed a lot and uh, it's troublesome bleeding. It can ha happen throughout the day. And uh, mainly, main modes of treatment are rectal supralphate and argon plasma coagulation. Thank you. That's about uh, it, about the causes for rectal bleeding. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, thank you very much, sir, for that informative presentation. Uh, it's time to enlighten a few queries. Please write your questions clear in the chat box. We have one question, sir. Uh, can Botox cause insufficiency of external sphincter as well? Very, very unlikely. Uh, it's usually because uh, it is mainly injected with the internal sphincter. Uh, but uh, it depends on the person who inject. But if you carefully inject, it doesn't cause external sphincter incontinence. Uh, but it can cause uh, uh, incontinence of haters. This Euphoria Prostata Extract, brand name Sitcom, show any benefit against hemorrhoids? Uh, well, that I have to read for, I don't know. Uh, uh, well, um, yeah, I'll, I think I, I would uh, answer that question after referring, I, I don't know. How to prepare a patient for an occult blood test? Yeah, so uh, usually preparation is, uh, you have to prepare patients over three days. Uh, so should uh, avoid iron tablets and should not take uh, vitamin C containing uh, material like uh, fruit juice, fruits, and vitamin C should be avoided and should not eat uh, red meat, so which contains heme. So three days preparation is enough and it should be repeated twice. If there are no more queries, I would like to thank Dr. Prabhat Kumar Singh for his excellent presentation on behalf of GMOSG Knowledge Academy. And I would like to present a token of appreciation to Dr. Prabhat Kumar Singh. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. Have a good day. Stay safe.